you were late. Come in on time next time. <laughs> we're going to finish up our series today talking about what it means to live as God's people in a changed time. And each week so far, I've, I've led off with statistics trying to convince you the world has already changed from the way you thought it was. Uh, no statistics this week. If you haven't been convinced already, there's no more numbers that are going to do it. You're living it. You know the world is different. The world has changed. And by the way, it won't stop either. Wait a few years and it'll be different again. This is the nature of things so it has ever been. The world has changed. The challenge for us is how to be a people with convictions and values and purpose in a world where the, the target seems to move, the, the, the circumstances change. And it is absolutely challenging to answer the question, now what? I've had pretty good uh, positive feedback on the lessons the last couple of weeks, but the, the only uh, kind of negative comment, and it was a politely negative comment uh, in, in jest, made about last week's sermon was, I was waiting at the end for you to tell us what to do. I go, what, what are we going to do? What's, what's, what's the answer to the forward-thinking problem? And I'll tell you, that those are the, that's the easiest kind of preaching to do, to get up and say, now here's what we're going to do, and you tell them and then we do it. Um, it's not the most fruitful and productive. Uh, I have a tendency to favor open-ended preaching because that's where the good stuff happens. When you take the principles and values that we believe in, our convictions, and apply them to the circumstances of your life, you find answers I never would have dreamed of the uh, college committee that's you know, doing some discernment and prayer right now about the future of college ministry, um, they're going to find answers I hadn't thought of, and they're going to pray about it. Uh, our family team that helps me with family ministry is going to meet this afternoon, and they'll come up with ideas that I hadn't thought of, and that's the value of the process if you leave the now what open. And it turns out that is precisely the answer to today's question as well. Uh, if you know our value statements that we've been doing in order, we're passion-driven, forward-thinking, spirit-led. What does it mean to be spirit-led in a changed world? And the answer is somewhat open-ended. And it has to be. Because that is the nature of the spirit and his work in the world. I brought myself a metaphor today to, to make the point. Uh, in Christian history, there's lots of symbols. The cross, of course, represents Christianity and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Often, a uh, candle is used to represent the presence of the Spirit. And you see that in a lot of Christian background. They'll light a candle, and it's a way, if it lights, of recognizing the presence of the Spirit. It's a callback to Acts chapter 2 where the Spirit descends on the disciples in the form of a tongue of fire, it says. It's a nice metaphor because it's, it's just there. It has uh, presence, and yet it, you don't touch it directly. Right? It's a nice symbol. There is one big difference between a candle, a little fire, and the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of big differences, but one in particular that's of note, and that is that a candle and my little lighter, responds on command. Today, I wanted to have a candle, and so I got a lighter and a candle, and I lit it. And it did exactly what I wanted. And if I blow it out, I can do it again, right? It responds on command. I can take initiative. In uh, the occult, if you go and don't, by the way, but if you go and look into the occult, uh, they use candles, too. But they use it as a way of evocation, of, of summoning, of conjuring, of you use the candle to ensnare some kind of power in the universe. Christians don't think of it that way because we don't think of the Spirit that way. The apostles in Acts chapter 2 didn't say, all right, we'd like to know what's next. Spirit, come down here, flames of fire, be nice. No, the Spirit simply arrived. In another chapter of Acts, the, the church is praying, and at the end of the prayer, there's a clap of thunder that shakes the whole room. 
And the Spirit said, Amen. Well, they didn't summon that. They didn't ask for it. In fact, it wasn't even the same metaphor as the previous time. But they knew what it meant. The Spirit had acted. And they simply recognized it. And so by way of metaphor, that's what I want us to be thinking today, is that our task with being Spirit-led, there's not an equation you solve, and at the end of it you say, oh good, I've been led by the Spirit. I did what I was supposed to do. It's not even something you initiate. Being led by the Spirit is something that you recognize. You see it and you know it when it happens. And being led by the Spirit requires that of us. We've been looking at Acts chapter 15, which is a phenomenal example of what it means to be led by the Spirit, although the language of the Holy Spirit is barely present in the passage. I went looking for the Holy Spirit this week. You know, we talk about trying to get something to happen on command. I looked up at the sky and said, all right, I've got to preach on being Spirit-led this week. And the Spirit, you know, didn't grace me with uh, a clap of thunder or a tongue of fire or any such thing, right? No, no event followed. Oddly enough, I went looking for the Holy Spirit this week, and I found instead James. James, the brother of our Lord, who plays prominently in Acts chapter 15. And I want to look at today as a great example of what it means to be Spirit-led. He's the guy, for whatever reason, if you know the story, in Acts chapter 15, the debate is, what do we do about these Gentiles? The Gentiles are hearing the gospel and believing it, and the question that the Jewish community, which all the Christians at this point are Jewish by background, the question they have is, what do we do with these Gentiles? What do we demand of them? And so they have this little council, this little meeting in Jerusalem. They call everybody in, and everybody's there. Paul, Barnabas, Peter. But apparently the chairman of the meeting is none of those guys. It's James the brother of our Lord, who is one of the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. I don't know how he gets picked for that job. It was a terrible short straw to draw. But he gets somehow to be the guy who's kind of the spokesman of this group that's trying to figure out what to do next. And James has to embrace the idea of being led by God. And if you'll take a look at James, you really do see it. First of all, to be led by the Spirit starts with openness, a willingness to hear what's happening, what's going on. And you see this from the beginning with James. His name doesn't even appear in the first two verses, but he's there. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. Okay. Where's the openness in this part of the story? You actually don't get it here, but if you go to Galatians, when Paul is retelling the events that led up to this story, the men that came to Galatia and were giving instructions to the Gentiles that they needed to be circumcised. The ones that said we need to eat kosher foods and keep doing things the way Jewish folks did. Paul says those men came from James. James is not a neutral arbiter in this story. He is not a guy who's there with no opinion. It never tells us specifically what did James think before. But the men who did have an opinion, the text in Galatians says, came from James and were sent by him. James, if we have to guess, is not in agreement with Paul, is not in agreement with Barnabas, is not in agreement with Peter. James, if we have to guess, is one of the guys who thinks these Gentiles who believe need to be circumcised, need to follow the law of Moses and its particulars. And so now when you read this text you get a hint of the openness to, of James that would have been very easy for him to say, I already have an opinion on this. Those guys expressing that point of view, they came from my camp. They're my guys. This debate that's going on would have included people like James who thought like James. And yet James is willing 
to hear the conversation out and see what God has to say. And then, marvelously, if I'm reading this correctly, by the end of the story, James not only has changed his mind, but is the spokesman for the new position that's going to go out to all the churches. He is a person who is open to what God is doing in the circumstance. So being led by the Spirit begins with openness, a willingness to hear, and if need be, to change. The hardest part of being led by the Spirit is the requirement of discernment. This is a fun word, discernment, because it would be easy for it to mean nothing. I know what analysis is, I know what calculation is, I know what making a decision is, but discerning something seems fuzzy to me, does it you? If I say, go discern that, what does that mean? You mean like make a decision? No, don't make a decision, discern it. You mean analyze it? No, I want you to discern it. You mean calculate it? No, I want you to make a discernment. It's a much fuzzier term, even what it means, and yet it is absolutely essential to being led by the Spirit because it's the application of principles to everyday life, and when you do that, it's fuzzy around the edges, and it takes wisdom. And yet when you read the Bible, specifically here in Acts 15, but throughout the Bible, that kind of terminology is used consistently. Listen to the verbs three times in Acts 15. They have their conversation, and James is ready to announce his judgment, and that's what he calls it. He says, here is my judgment, and here is how is it announced. It's announced. Listen to the language. I highlighted it for you on the screen. And verse 22 of Acts 15, then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. What does that mean? It seemed good. I went looking in the Greek text to see if it would tell me something new, and it means it seemed good. Yeah, it wasn't helpful at all. It's a very open-ended term, and he keeps using it. James, in his own speech, in verse 25, a few verses later, says, it has seemed good to us, having come to one accord to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. And then three verses later, he uses the same verse or phrase, only it gets even stranger, because listen how he does it this time. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. There's about the only reference to the Holy Spirit in the whole text. It seemed good. What does that mean, James? It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us, is his description of the whole process. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. You have to forgive me if the first time I read that I was really disappointed because I wanted to know, like, did you make a pro and con list? How did you do this? If my children come to me and say, if your children come to you and they've done something that you think is foolish and you say, why did you do that? And they say, it seemed like a good idea at the time. You are not satisfied with that answer. That is the language used in this passage. It's the language of discernment. It's the language of looking at something and saying, I can't give you the exact equation of how we got from A to B, but we discerned and it seems like this. It's used throughout the Bible and some of the most pivotal phrases. Uh, In the Old Testament, King David is arranging for a military endeavor in 1 Chronicles chapter 13. And he goes to his generals. David consulted with the commanders of the thousands of hundreds with every leader. And David said to all the assembly of Israel, If it seems good to you and from the Lord our God, let us send abroad to our brothers who remain in all the lands of Israel and we'll do the following things. And he explains the campaign they're going to launch on. He says, I want your judgment. I want your discernment. And what I want to know is, does it seem good And does it seem like it's from God? David, do you not know what you're supposed to be doing? Aren't you king? Don't you have a job? Is it clear? Don't you know right and wrong? Yeah, I do. But the question of how do we actually implement what needs to happen next is a little open-ended. He says we've got to discern. We've got to look and say, is this what God wants us to do? And the language of it is, does it seem good? 
In the New Testament, you find it in one more surprising place that I, I was shocked to find, although I should have known it was there. Because we think of the Bible as like the definitive answer to the question of life, and I treat the Bible as my definitive guidebook for living. The Bible says something, that settles it for me. But ask the guys who wrote the Bible how they decided to do that. Listen to Luke explain how he decided to write the book of Luke. This is Luke chapter 1, 1 through 3. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Luke, why did you write the Gospel of Luke? Were you deep in the Spirit on the Lord's day and a vision came down from on high and a voice thundered in your living room and said, Luke, you will write the Gospel of Luke and you'll write it better than John did. Is that what happened? Luke said, no. Luke said, you know, it seemed like what I should be doing. Don't you wish there was more detail? And yet, quite often, that is the nature of discernment. Being led by the Spirit, he doesn't often telegraph it. Once in a while, there's a tongue of fire that comes down from on high, and you say, well, I guess that was it. Once in a while, there's a thunderclap, and you say, ah, well, I guess that's the answer. The rest of the time, you are trying to recognize what God is doing based on what he's already done. You're asking the question, does this seem like what God is leading us toward? James, who more than likely already had his mind made up, went into this meeting open-minded enough to say, well, let's ask. And then by the end of it, there was no clap of thunder, no flame of fire, just discussion and prayer. And at the end of it, three times he says, you know, it seems like this is what the Holy Spirit wants us to do. This is what seems good. It has the shape of goodness. It tastes like goodness. It sounds like what God would do in this circumstance. And that's what we should do. Additionally, we notice something, if you're looking for kind of a test to see, is this something the Spirit is leading us towards? One indication I find throughout Scripture is that following the Spirit means accepting burdens, not adding them to others. It's very rare that when the Spirit is really leading somebody, he tells that person, everything you want to do right now is right, and those other people need to get straightened out. It's very rare. When the Spirit is leading people, he leads them to change them more than he does say, you're right, those other guys are in trouble. It's about accepting burdens. It's the harder road, not the easier one. This is how James describes it again in Acts 15, 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements. And then he lists off the four kind of compromise measures that they had agreed on. Here are the things we're asking Gentiles to do to keep these communities at peace with the Gentiles. But they weren't asking them And the debate was, will they be circumcised? Will they keep the law of Moses and all of its rules? And James says, we aren't going to lay that burden on you. James is already keeping the law of Moses. James has already done all these things. The easy answer is, yes, it seems good to us and to the Holy Spirit for you to have to do some stuff. And at the end of it, James says the opposite. He says, what it seems like the Holy Spirit has always led us to do is for us to accept a burden to make life easier for you. That shouldn't surprise us either because we serve Jesus Christ our Lord. Where did the Spirit lead Jesus? At the beginning of the gospel, Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. At the end of the gospel, Jesus is led by God to a cross. The Spirit does not lead us in paths of ease. The Spirit leads us to accept burdens, not to pile them on others. If you think the Spirit's leading you towards something and it sounds suspiciously like the easy thing you wanted to do in the first place, you have to be suspicious 
of your discernment. Finally, uh, not finally, almost finally, we're getting close. Following the leadership of the Spirit results in joy and fruitfulness. The process of discernment is messy. The process of listening and trying to hear what God has to say is even frightening. Can you imagine how much pressure was on James in this meeting? How many people he feels like he's going to be letting down? (laughs) How many people he feels like he's going to be disappointing with what he ultimately decides to make his judgment? It was scary. But what was the result of accepting the clarity of what God would have them to do? So when they were sent off, they, they write this letter, and they said, here's the decision of the council. Take the letter to the churches, and then we hold our breath to see what they're going to do. They went down to Antioch, having gathered the congregation together, and they delivered the letter. And how does the church respond to this challenging, unexpected, and unprecedented decision? And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. And Judas and Silate, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. And after they had spent some time, they were sent off in peace by the brothers to those who had sent them. The result of the clarity, was it challenging? Yes. Was it unprecedented? Yes. Did they know how it was going to turn out? No, they didn't. But the result of the clarity they felt of doing the thing that seemed like what God wanted them to do was joy. And they got to set aside this issue that had been distracting them internally. And instead, they got to focus with one vision on the things that mattered. If you read the rest of the text, they immediately go out and start preaching the gospel. Now they know what they're supposed to be doing. They weren't sure about these Gentiles, and they didn't have an answer, and it was confusing. Now they know, and that clarity gives them an opportunity to joyfully go out and do God's will. The process of discernment can be agonizing, but I promise you the result of letting God have his say and following his will is a peace of mind and even a joy with what God is doing. Final, final thought today, and for this entire series, I was thinking this week, I wish I could go and ask James. Like now the letter's been written, the ink is dry, it's been sent out, he said what he's going to say, 2,000 years have passed, and I want to take James aside and say, what was that like? How, how did that really go? Were you, did you feel led by the Spirit? How would you describe it? And it occurred to me, I told you, that the Spirit didn't show up to me this week in any like visible way. There was no tongue of fire or clap of thunder, anything like that. But I did have a moment where I felt like I got to know James a little bit. Because it occurred to me that this guy, James, actually does give us that answer. Not in Acts 15, but in the book that bears his name. If, as tradition suggests, the book of James is written by James, the brother of Jesus, the same guy from Acts 15, you might notice some interesting things about the way James feels about being led by the Spirit. First of all, he doesn't use that language very much. The word Spirit only occurs two times in the entire five chapters of James, and it's never a reference to the Holy Spirit. It's a reference to the human spirit, once in chapter 2 and once in chapter 4. So if you're looking for that, he never explicitly talks about it. But he describes what we've just talked about in considerable detail. He opens the book in James chapter 1, verse 5, a verse that I, due to my background, can only recite to you out of the King James Bible because that's how I was made to memorize it, so deal with it. It says, If any man lacketh wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. James says, If you ever find yourself lacking wisdom, there is someone you can ask. Was there ever a time in James' life where he felt like he was lacking wisdom? We just read it. It was Acts 15, where the biggest decision the church had faced up to that moment and for many years to come lay very much at his feet. Other other people involved. It wasn't just James making an edict and saying, "Here's," but he was the guy speaking for the group. And he said, I learned that day 
If you lack wisdom, you can ask and God will give it. And then in chapter 3 of James, he describes that wisdom. And listen to how he describes it. He says, who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works and the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. What did you just read? James describing his own way of thinking prior to Acts 15. He said, we were fighting. Christians were arguing amongst themselves. We were going to the Gentile converts and demanding something of them, not accepting a burden for ourselves. We were selfishly saying, what we do is right and you need to accept it. He says, and it occurred to me somewhere in there that that kind of thinking, and listen to how he describes it. He doesn't say, Holy Spirit, listen to how he describes it. It's earthly, it's from down here, it's sensual, unspiritual, it's from in here, and he says, it's actually even demonic. I thought it was my best two cents, my intuition, my judgment. He says, I think it was the whisper of demons. It certainly didn't come from God, and as a result, we didn't have peace, we didn't have joy. What did we have? Jealousy, ambition, disorder, and every vile practice. We were making a mess of the church. Well, James, what's the alternative? Listen to this. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Tell me that's not James narrating to you the process of Acts 15. He said, what did the wisdom, he doesn't say spirit-led, he says, but I got wisdom from above. I recognized, I didn't summon it, but I recognized the light of God in this wisdom, and it was pure. I was selfish, it was pure. It was peaceable, I was causing problems, it was gentle and able to get along. It was open to reason. James had his mind made up, but he listened, and he was open, and Paul made his case, and Barnabas made his case, and Peter made his case, and James says, I heard it, and it was full of mercy and good fruits. I saw what God was doing among the Gentiles. It was impartial. James wasn't impartial. James viewed the Gentiles very differently than himself, but the wisdom of God was impartial. He said, and I heard it, and it was sincere. He says, I asked for wisdom, and I got it, and it didn't come from inside. I recognized a wisdom from above. And the result? A harvest of peace, which is exactly how Luke narrates it in Acts. We sent out the letter, and the gospel went out, and good happened beyond what our wildest dreams would have been. He says, that's the difference from the spirit below and the spirit above. What does it mean to be spirit-led? It's acknowledging and recognizing this kind of wisdom that comes from God instead of the kind that originates within myself down below. Would you pray with me? Father, you are not some mere spirit to be summoned to do our will. You are the God and creator of the universe, and we bow before you. Help us to pray the prayer of indifference to our own desires. Help us to be open to what you will have us to do in all circumstances as the world changes around us. Help us to discern, to see what seems good to you, and from you, rather than our own selfish desires. Help us to accept the good fruit and the peace that comes from pursuing your will and the wisdom that comes from above. 
Help us see it from you in each other as your glory goes in all the world. In the name of Jesus, your Son, and in the presence of your Spirit. Amen.